the sermon today does come from Luke chapter 22. I encourage you to turn there. We're going to talk today about the table of thanks. I heard that uh, at this Sunday there'd be some people, or this, this week rather, about Thursday, there's going to be a lot of people having family dinner. And that may well be the case for you. And I want to go back to Scripture. And this, this message will serve as a, a, a communion meditation. As the entire service is really, our minds go back to the last supper that Jesus had with his apostles. It is in Luke chapter 22. I encourage you to turn there. I'll be in the New International Version, uh, verses 14 uh, through 20. Where the Bible says this. It says, When the hour came... Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how be your name now and forevermore. Thank you, Lord, that you love the world. You so loved the world, you gave us your son. Thank you for the life and ministry of Jesus, and thank you that he loved us. His life was not taken, but he laid his life down for us and on our behalf. Substitutionary, his life in place of our own for each of us. Thank you for Jesus. Father, may we see through the scripture the importance of communion, the importance of this supper, the last supper, the Lord's Supper. What happens here as it's recorded in Luke chapter 22. We pray that you're glorified here at East Point, glorified through us. We ask you for increase in the church, no matter who plants or who waters. All the increase in the kingdom belongs to you. We ask you for increase. We pray you're glorified through us and in us as we labor here at East Point. We praise and thank you and pray it all in Jesus' name today. Amen. Now here in Luke 22, you find what is also recorded in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John chapter 13. You have the Last Supper. Well, what is the Last Supper? It occurred at the Passover. You can say Passover if you want to. If you want to, if you don't want to, say Passover. <laughs> Passover. And what, what is the Passover? Well, the Passover is a, is a festival. That's true. Uh, the Passover was, was one of three, fe- three festivals that was required under the Old Testament. When I say it's required, I mean they, the Jewish men were, according to the law of Moses, they were required to attend. Now, you also have a Pentecost and the Feast of Tabernacle. Those two feasts with the Passover make the three feasts that were, they were required to, to attend. When I say required, I mean they were supposed to be there. I mean the Bible says in the book of Numbers, it says, uh, chapter 9, verse 13, it says, if a, man who, uh, if a man who fails to celebrate the Passover, that man, that person must be cut off from his people. That man will bear the consequences of his sin. So if you fail to celebrate the Passover, you're... Basically excommunicated. You're cut out of the Lord's people. 
You'll bear the consequences of your own sin. The Passover was required. It was a festival, but it's more than a festival. Well, what is the Passover? You remember uh, in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the five, first five books of the Bible, those books were written by Moses. And the book of Exodus, the word Exodus, it means, means exit. Exodus means exit. And what happens it is the promise God made to a man named Abram in the book of Genesis. Abram, in his old age, God changed his name to Abraham. The promise that God made to Abraham, uh, Abraham's children were enslaved. They were physically, they were captured, and they were made to work as slaves in Egypt. And the book of Exodus, Exodus means exit. The book of Exodus is how God's children, the children of Abraham, how they got out of Egypt. They exited Egypt. And man, did they ever exit Egypt. I mean, tell you, there, there were ten plagues. Uh, Egypt, as you know, that country today, it's the longest river in the world, runs through Egypt. It runs from uh, south to the north. And it is the uh, Nile River, right? The Nile River, the first of the plagues was, uh, the Nile River was turned to blood. And then there were frogs and gnats and flies and the death of the livestock, and boils and hell and locusts, locusts, hailstorm like never been seen before, and then darkness, and pretty well after nine plagues, the entire country of Egypt was ruined, in fact. Some of the, some of the, uh, the uh, advisors to Pharaoh said, they said, can't you see all of Egypt is ruined? Let these people go. And Pharaoh, his heart was hard. And he said, no, I will not let the people go. And that's where we find the tenth and final plague. In Egypt, the people were there in slavery. They're going to get out of slavery in the most magnificent of ways. This is what God instructed. In Exodus chapter 12, God gave the rules. He said, you take a lamb, a year old, a male without any defect, and you sacrifice the lamb. And if you, when you sacrifice the lamb, you put... You put some of its blood on the doorpost of your house. And if you put the lamb's blood on your doorpost, the judgment of God, God had declared that the firstborn in every house in Egypt would die. But if the Israelites would apply the blood of the lamb, then they would be passed over when the judgment of God occurred. Now think about it. These people, Abraham's children, they were there 400 years in Egypt. A little over 400 years actually. They'd been exposed to idol worship. There was no law of Moses. There were no Ten Commandments at that time. They were all a bunch of idol worshipers. They were just as guilty as everybody else in Egypt. You see what I'm saying? But if believing the Word of God and if they would be obedient to apply the blood of the Lamb, then they would be passed over from the judgment of God Almighty. In Exodus 12, verse 13, the Bible says this, God said, God said to His people, said, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Passover. One of the three feasts that God declared every man had to attend, they were required. If they didn't attend the Passover, they were cut off from their people. From the time that Moses led the people out of Egypt to the time Jesus was born, it's about 1,450 years. For over 1,400 years, they celebrate once a year. Passover. And they commemorate at the Passover festival in Jerusalem. Once Jerusalem was established as capital, they commemorate every year, once a year, Passover. And they, they remember how God led His children out of slavery. By what? The blood of the Lamb. When we turn open our Bibles to Luke chapter 22, and it says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, he said, 
I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. When you study Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verse 51, the Bible says Jesus, it says he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That's in Luke chapter 9. You don't find the triumphal entry into Jerusalem until Luke chapter 19. It takes 10 chapters in Luke's gospel to get there. For this one feast, the feast of Passover. And when everything's set up and everything's prepared and Jesus is reclined at the table, he said, I have eagerly desired. In other places in the Bible, this word is translated as lusted. Jesus is saying, I have eagerly, I have coveted, I wanted, I've desired eagerly to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And that's where we're at. In Luke chapter 22. The Bible says there, his desire was so great he sits down to eat and this is different. We know Jesus' ministry was three years long. The Bible says in Luke chapter 3, in Luke chapter 3 it says Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry. When you count the Passover feast and the ministry of Jesus, we know his ministry lasted three years because the Passover occurs once a year. At this Passover, though, this is the final Passover. And you can hear the finality in the voice and in the words of Jesus. Jesus said there in Luke 22, verse 16, He told the disciples, I tell you, I will not eat again of the Passover. That's what He's talking about. I will not eat again of the Passover until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. He says, I will not eat the Passover. Passover is once a year. All men are supposed to eat it. I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the now kingdom of God. That's some language that Jesus uses regularly. In fact, the phrase kingdom of God occurs 51 verses in the New Testament. I don't have, for time's sake, I'm not going to show you all 51 verses, but I would like to show you about seven. And this, this is just a Kingdom of God occurs over and over, and I just want to show you what I'm talking about. I don't know, Mark chapter 1, Bible says, verse 15, this is Jesus speaking. The time has come, the kingdom of, kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. That's what Jesus preached when his ministry started. Luke chapter 8, the Bible says, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. That sounds familiar. Luke chapter 6, the Bible says, Blessed are you who are poor, Jesus said, for yours is? You see, Jesus did that regular. I don't know, Matthew, Matthew chapter 19. Jesus said, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. You see, it's over and over and over. John 3, verse 5, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the unless he is born of the water and of the Spirit. Mark 10, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the like a little child will never enter it. Luke chapter 9, Jesus said this. Now hear this. As he speaks to people standing around him, he says, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the... Jesus had taught. The kingdom of God was coming. It was imminent. But now at the Last Supper, he says, I have eagerly desired to eat with you this supper before I suffer. Before I suffer... Before I suffer, I have eagerly desired to celebrate with the Passover supper. To have this meal before my time is up. He says in finality, he says, I will not eat Passover again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Furthermore, he says in Luke 22, verse 18, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. This is like all the other Passover feasts up till now. But at the same time, it's so much different. Because Jesus says this is the last one. And Jesus then does what there's no evidence he does any other time except for at the Last Supper. Jesus, as Luke records, he says in verse 19, verse 20, he says, this is my body. He took the bread. He said as he blessed it, as he broke it, as he gave it to them. This is my body given for you. He says in verse 20, he says, This cup, as he took the cup that they were about to drink of, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
which is poured out for you. See, what they did at the Passover feast, they took unleavened bread, leaven, which is yeast, which makes the bread rise. But in Egypt, it was a hasty thing. The judgment of God was coming. They didn't have time for the bread to rise, for one thing. More than that, spiritually, the leaven, the yeast, it, it represented sin. And this was to be unleavened bread, made in haste. And they had bitter herbs, which was a memorial for all the bitter years that they were enslaved in Egypt. And they celebrated every year with this unleavened bread and with these bitter herbs to remember how God had rescued them and brought them out of slavery by the blood of the Lamb. And Jesus now says, this, is, this bread is my body. This cup is my blood which is poured out for you. You see what happens? Jesus is saying it's, it's fulfillment. It's coming to, uh, to fruition. The things that God had promised. You know, As you read in the Law of Moses, um, the Bible says... In the law of Moses, there are so many sacrifices, blood sacrifices. In fact, for the forgiveness of sin, blood was required. The, the New Testament, over in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, in chapter 9, verse 22, the Hebrew writer says, The law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now Jesus, before he suffers, he's saying, This is new, this is different. This is what you've never heard before. I will not eat of the Passover again. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until all this brine brings brine's fulfillment in and the kingdom of God comes. It's new. It's different. Jesus says, there's no forgiveness we know without the shedding of blood. And Jesus is bringing the sacrifice once for all to take away sin. That's what his suffering is all about. Hebrews 9, you know verse 22, we just read it. But the Hebrew writer goes through as he distinguishes the old covenant was good. The new covenant is better. A key word as you read through Hebrews is better. And Hebrews 9, staying with the same thought, verse 26, hear what the Spirit says to the church. Christ has appeared once for all to do away with sin by the sacrifice of. The footnote in my Bible says, boom, shakalaka. Once for all. Sin is, is not swept under the rug. It's paid for, justified, as if we'd never sinned. It's paid for, paid in full. This is my body given for you. This cup is the new covenant, my blood, which is poured out for you. It's new, it's different. Jesus is paving the way for salvation with his own blood. Once for all. The Last Supper. You see what happens. When Jesus says, this is my body, when he says, this is my blood, he tells the disciples expressly here, you've you got to understand how different this is. I have been blessed. I've been blessed to study the Bible quite a bit. And I had a job for five years. I had to drive three hours a day. And what do you do with three hours on the road? And I studied the Bible. And uh, I, then I drove to law school for three years. And... Uh, what do you do on the road? Study the Bible. Most important thing I learned in, the book, in, the, in law school, three years of law school, best thing I ever learned is the book of Hebrews. They, that wasn't a class that they taught at school. But I've been able to study. Uh, several books, I've, I've been able to study. Do you know what? These words where Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, I haven't found it anywhere else. There's nothing else in the entire Bible that Jesus ever says, do this in remembrance of me. Oh, preacher. Preacher, he had to say, remember my birthday. Because that's why all the world celebrates Christmas. Do your head like this right here. No, there's no instance in the New Testament where, where they celebrated the birth of Jesus. We know he was born. We don't know it was the 25th day of December, but uh, we're, praise the Lord, joined the world, he came. Jesus never said about anything else, do this remembrance of me, but for his death. His sacrifice, his body, his blood, he said, do this in remembrance of me. 
It's new. It's the memorial. The souls of men were purchased by His blood at Calvary. Do this in remembrance of me. Can you hear what the Spirit says to the church? The love of Christ, it compels us. We are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he who died for all, and he died for all, that those who lived should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. That's our plight, Christian. Brother and sister, you're in Christ, you love the Lord, you're obedient to his commands, you're born again through the word of God, obedience to his word. We're brand new, we're made new, we're in Christ. Our home's not here, our home's in heaven. And his love compels us. Because he died for us, we've all died, and those of us who live should live for him, for his glory. You see how it works. The love of Christ compels us. When we take communion, we remember his love. It's the only thing Jesus ever said to do in his memory when we remember him. We remember his sacrifice. Do you know, Jesus has nothing more. There's nothing more to draw people to him except for the cross. And there's nothing to keep people faithful to him except for the cross. And when we take communion, we remember the cross of Christ. We remember his love and his love compels us to live for him because he died in our place. Amen. You see how important it is. As the Bible teaches uh, the New Testament church, I'll give you three reasons of why it is, three reasons we take communion on every Sunday. Uh, number one, there is Bible precedent for it. Where the Bible speaks, we believe we ought to speak. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible's silent, we're silent. So the Bible precedent for breaking the bread is, uh, which is communion, that's what it means, break bread, is in Acts 20, verse 7. That on the first day of the week, they came together too. It's just a quiet, subtle way. That's why they came together, and there's no explanation given. Do you know that for 200 years, until 200 AD, everything, all Christian writing that occurs from the time of Jesus to 200 AD, it was universal and without exception that all Christians met on the first day of the week to break bread. Now, that, that history is not inspired. The Bible is inspired, God's Word. Church history is not inspired, so take it or leave it. It's food for thought. But that's clearly the precedent set in Scripture. That's why we do it. Number two is my favorite. is uh, We get to and we want to. You see, uh, pe people want to rule and say, Preacher, give me a rule where it says we have to take communion. I say, man, I'll be glad to. Let me tell you something. It ain't there. If there was a rule that said you had to take communion, you'd be half to. Right? And it's like, it's like, it's like for me, it's like getting kissed my wife. I, I never have to kiss my wife. But sometimes, I get to. And see, it's, it's a want to. The, the love of Christ compels us that he died for us. He died in our place. We're born again through his sacrifice. We don't have to remember his death. But we get to, and we want to, because as we partake of the body and the blood of Jesus, listen what the Spirit says to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see, when you take communion, it's, it's a sermon. You're teaching a lesson without saying a word. You're preaching, you're making a proclamation. We think of a proclamation as something you sh shout out, you proclaim the truth. We proclaim the Lord's death by sitting quietly by ourselves and taking of the bread and the juice. Because we do it in His memory. We proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you do this. But nonetheless, there are a lot of people, the King James says, as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup. And people say, well, as often as. But we don't have to do it every week. And if we did it every week, then it would lose, it would lose its importance. But I think that's inconsistent reasoning. And the reason, I mean, consider with me. I mean, you should pray. But don't pray too much. Because then prayer would be so common to you that you would forget who you're talking to. Do your head like this right here. 
The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, pray without ceasing. Pray all the time. Well, let's look at Bible study. I mean, study your Bible, but don't study it too much. Because then it would be commonplace, and you would, you would forget that you're really studying the Word of God. Do your head like he's right here. No, uh, the Bible says study to show yourself to prove. A workman needs not to be ashamed, correctly handles the word of truth. The Bible says in Acts 17, verse 11, says the Bereans were of more noble character than Thessalonians because they examined the Scripture every day to see if what Paul said was true. You see, uh, it doesn't work with prayer. It doesn't work with Bible study. What, what about church? Uh, what about church attendance? Doesn't work. Don't, don't attend too much church because then it'll become commonplace. That doesn't work. Even the people that don't take communion, they still take up an offering. Well, man, I don't want to take up offering too often because then we'll forget we're giving back to God. We don't, we don't use that logic or reasoning with anything else. Why would we use it with communion? It's not a have to. There's no command. We don't have to. We never have to. But by the grace of God, we get to. And we want to. And that's what it's all about, man. I, I'm obligated. I mean, if I'm going to preach the word, man, I've got to preach what the Bible says. The Bible, the Bible ties sickness and death in with missing the Lord's Supper. And I want to point that out to you straight from 1 Corinthians 11 where the Bible says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats the eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. The Holy Spirit ties missing communion with sickness and death. That's how important it is. Man, I, I hope to encourage you, don't, don't forsake the assembling of saints, as Hebrews chapter 10 says, verse 25. And don't miss the Lord's Supper, man, on the Lord's Day. If you can gather with the Lord's people, gather with the Lord's people and break the bread of life around the Lord's table. The Lord's Day with the Lord's people, breaking the bread of life, the Lord's table. Don't do it. Don't let anything stop you from it. I know of a preacher, great preacher, loved the Lord. His wife had brain cancer. She had surgery. She knew it was upcoming. There was a chance she wouldn't make it, and she didn't. And it was, a, it was like a Friday or Saturday, and she told him, said, if I'm not conscious on Sunday, said, uh, if I'm not conscious on Sunday, you take some of, the, some of the communion bread and you rub it on my lip. Praise the Lord for those who believe. God is true and God is faithful. It's not a have to, it's a get to. There's Bible precedent for it. And, and as often as we do it, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Can you, can you see the importance? We, we, we say what Peter said in 1 Peter 1 verse 13. says, set your hope on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. It's not works. We can't earn heaven. But by the grace of God. Salvation is possible for those who believe. Can you see the importance? The only thing the Lord's Christ, the God Almighty, the Messiah, the only thing the Christ ever said to do in his memory, this is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out, a new covenant, my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. See, we're about, we're about to take the Lord's Supper. Our minds, I hope the mind of every believer here, we go back to Calvary. I hope we go back to Matthew in chapter 26. Chapter 27, rather. Matthew 27. Mark 15. Luke chapter 23 and John 19. We go back to where the place called Calvary. Scripture calls it Golgotha, the place of the skull. The dearest and best, wounded once for all, treated as a criminal. His stripes are many. He was marred beyond human likeness, but he did it for you. He did it for me. And by his stripes, we are healed. You see, we're going to take of this loaf and cup in a moment. And it's only for those who are part of the family of God. 
You may well have a dinner with your loved ones this Thursday. I hope you do. This dinner every, every Sunday served here, the Lord's Supper. And it's for all the family of God. Whoever's obedient, we invite all believers. If you've obeyed the gospel of Christ, you're welcome. We don't close the table or guard the table. It's open. If you've been obedient to the word of God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my command. It's not about uh, legalism or having done something to earn it. It's about loving Christ and being obedient to his command. We're part of his family. We have Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13 verse 10 says, we have an altar we have an altar to eat from, which those who ministered at the tabernacle, they didn't have the right to eat. If that's not communion, church, I don't know what it would be. You see, at the Lord's Supper, we're taking of the body and the blood of the Christ. And we proclaim his death until he comes. Before we take today, it would be unfair for us. We're all a bunch of sinners saved by the grace of God, right? The difference between sinners and saints is one's being forgiven and the other one ain't. And it would be unfair, fundamentally unfair, when God wants all men to be saved, it would be unfair for us to have this meal without giving you the opportunity to partake too. And for you to partake, what well, means you've got to obey the words of God. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Are you willing to repent of your sins, do things God's way? Will you make a confession with your lips? Will you be buried with Christ to have by the blood of Jesus, not by water, but by His blood to have your sins washed away so you'll receive the Holy Spirit of the Christ? Will you be raised to walk in new life? Will you live for His glory? If you love Him, you obey His commands. The Bible says in John chapter 3, and verse 16, maybe you've heard this before. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever... Believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life.